Hi, my name is Bryn Griffiths. Welcome to the Labour Left podcast. Our guest today is Rachel Garnham, the chair of the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy, usually known as the CLPD, one of the oldest and most established Labour Left organisations. Rachel has been a Labour activist for more than a quarter of a century, during which time she has held many positions. She's been on Labour's National Policy Forum. Spent, she spent more than a decade as Mid-Bedfordshire's Mid Labour Party secretary. And during Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the party, she sat on the National Executive. The picture that we're showing now shows her campaigning back in 2018 as part of the JC9 slate. That's the Jeremy Corbyn nine. How are you doing, Rachel? I'm very well, thank you. Very well, personally, uh, permanently angry politically, but um, I'm sure we'll move on to that. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that will probably be covered at some point during the podcast. Um, in the podcast, I want to draw upon CLPD's story. And the reason I want to do that is so we can understand our Labour history. And probably more important than that, consider how we can rebuild power within the Labour Party. So let's start with the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy formed by Vladimir and Vera Deira. This clip from the 1983 BBC docudrama, for me, sums up the very essence of CLPD. And um, Frank Alorn MP, I think, was the first president of CLPD, but we've got two left-wing stalwarts in this clip um, that we're going to play now. Eric Heffer MP, who, who famously walked off the stage when Neil Kinnock made his terrible speech during the miners' strike at Labour conference. And of course, Tony Benn, and who needs no introduction whatsoever. We are talking about accountability to the grassroots of this movement. We are talking about greater democracy in this movement. That is the real issue. It's because I have been responsible now for five years to see the policies develop in the subcommittees, come to the executive, go to the unions for consultation, be discussed in the liaison committee with the unions, come to conference, be endorsed. And then I have seen them cast aside in secret by those who are not accountable to this movement. So, Rachel, that, that's, that's a blast from the past, isn't it? And I, th I think that Eric's conveying the anger, but Tony in that clip really, to me, sort of, sets out what, what our campaign's about. What, what does it mean to you, that clip? What does it represent? Well, it is a different time, but it's also the, the issues haven't gone away, have they? So I think it, it tells us, um, represents sort of the need for Labour to listen to its grassroots and for um, MPs to be able to represent that in, in different forums. Um, and also um, it speaks to sort of Labour leaderships having, you know, needing to represent a broader membership and not just sort of plough their own furrow, which which does tend to be a, a feature, doesn't it? Yeah, and we're going to face that meeting where the NEC meets with the representatives of the Parliamentary Labour Party to determine a content of a manifesto. And a, I wonder whether, to quote Tony Benn, we might see Labour's policies cast aside in secret by those that are not accountable to this movement once again. It, it, it does seem to be a feature that um, leaderships would like to ignore their membership and progressive policies. They take the easy route uh, of going along with the establishment rather than really challenging um, the status quo. So the Deeras, Vladimir and Vera Deira were the, the, the key founders of the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy in back in 1973. Um, what, was, what was happening at that point and why did Vladimir and Vera think it was so important to start such a campaign? Well, I was they were an amazing couple. I was very lucky to join the CLPD executive um, in the early noughties when they were the both still very active and to be part of those sort of legendary uh, gatherings at, at Ten Park Drive. Um, but that, and to a certain extent, the issues hadn't changed now in the noughties and back in the seventies. So CLPD was founded in 1973. So we, we celebrated our, our 50th birthday um, last year and, um, 
the Deeras were the heart of the operation and the, the political context was um, the negative impacts of, of Labour's policy and the, the leadership's ignoring of, of Labour policy. Um, so the Deeras wanted to see um, Labour implement the policies of public ownership and the and sort of it, it was all around a sort of economic program that would benefit the majority of the population and the Labour leadership were just ignoring it and at that point there was no real democratic accountability of MPs it was a it was a job for life um, and the MPs elected the leader so there was very little um, engagement from members or from trade unions who of course had founded the Labour Party to be their representatives in Parliament um, so what what Vladimir and Vera did was to gather a, a group of you know very serious people around themselves who could with that, some concrete demands on mandatory reselection of MPs so that um, members had some uh, uh, there was accountability for MPs. They didn't just sort of go off into the wilderness and and do their own thing, pursue their own self interest. And um, later, but absolutely related, widening the mandate for the Labour leadership. So the Labour leadership was not just accountable to to its MPs in this sort of self perpetuating tiny little um, clique in Westminster, detached from. The vast majority of the country you know what CLPD wanted was um, these basic what we now see as democratic norms to be implemented in the Labour Party and the, the reason for wanting to do that was so that the Labour Party would stick to its founding principles and actually represent working people and and have an economic policy that would redistribute wealth um, which is I think is what Labour's always stood for and public ownership yeah, I think it was um, back in 1973, Wilson had completely rejected the inclusion of the public uh, uh, in the manifesto of the public ownership of the 25 largest manufacturing companies. Sounds almost quaint now, the idea to talk about the largest manufacturing countries. We have hardly got a manufacturing base left. But at that point, there was an alternative economic strategy, wasn't there, that was setting out what Labour's economic policy was going to be and how it was going to impact on the major sectors of the economy. And, and Wilson wasn't having it. And so... Yep, just ignored it. Yeah, and so Vladimir Vladimir and Vera came up with the idea of the CLPD and, and 50 years ago, the um, just over 50 years ago, the struggle began. I find yeah. it... Sorry. Well, and their strength was to bring people together. You know, they weren't leading the charge. They were bringing, mm. although their sort of own work ethic and tactics were central to it it was bringing those different um strands of people together who had you know wanted to look seriously that you know they weren't just wanting to repeat the point they really wanted to change the rules and to understand how the labor party worked and the sort of alliances that were needed in order to change the rules you know they weren't just banging a drum they were walking the walk, talking the talk, building the alliances that could actually make real change. I think one of the very, very interesting things about Vladimir, when you think about him putting such a focus on labour movement democracy, was, it, was his history. Because he comes from what was then Czechoslovakia, um, and his father, Ivan, um, was a social democratic minister in various Czech governments. So I wonder with, whether with what came later um after the when the cold war began and and czechoslovakia found itself within the eastern bloc whether that that was influential on the importance he placed on democracy in, in our own labor movement possibly he was an extremely interesting person i was you know sorry to only get to know him a little bit at the final sort of stages of his life and he he wasn't grounded in what can be sometimes a little bit backwards labor movement you know he had a much more internationalist perspective and yeah fundamental to that was was democracy and he understood that you can't disentangle democracy from policy um but um and yeah he, he his tactical approach to things and how he would try and build those alliances and, and make those changes was was clearly founded 
um, in, in his experience. And he, yeah, I, I understand. I don't know much about this, but he, you know, he had that interest in in Eastern Europe and um, at, at a time when that wasn't necessarily fashionable. Um, and it, he was a fascinating person, and he, you know, he was dynamic as well. You know, he he didn't just wait for things to happen he brought people together for, you know i i first when i was first getting involved it was around when the center left grassroots alliance was founded and he was absolutely central to that recognizing that there were compromises to be made in order to win so yeah i think it's it's worth talking about that left strategy because when I was active in the, the Labour left in the 90s, one of Vladimir's most consistent themes related for the Labour need for the Labour left to focus upon winning the support of Labour's middle ground. And I don't mean centrist by that. I mean the middle ground of the Labour Party. Those people, if you like, Labour loyalists who hold contradictory positions supporting left policies, but also being loyal, and we all know about this, even deferential to whoever happens to be the Labour leadership, now, that that was very much Vladimir's method and bore huge amounts of fruit. Do you think we can still do that today? How, how do we reach out and rebuild a coalition that can win in the Labour Party? I think we absolutely can do that and have to do that. I think, um, you know, all of us should take uh, stock of where the Labour Party is in its historic sweep, you know, rather than just sort of look at the immediate conjunctural situation and you know the the Labour Party was founded by the trade unions which we can talk about that a bit more but also the vast majority of Labour Party members they want a Labour government but they want public ownership the, the you know we've, we remember the historic um, changes made by the 1945 Labour government founding the National Health Service and um, building council housing these are um policies that are broadly supported across you know 90 percent 95 percent of labor members across um you know almost 100 percent of trade unions and i think it's incumbent on us as a left who might have a more radical view of you know what can be done to remember that you know there is broad support within the labor party for democratic socialism or, or even social democracy which is to the left of what anyone's advocating at, at the moment and therefore you know building those alliances on that basis is has got to be um a, a priority and it shouldn't be difficult but uh, it always does prove a little bit difficult but yeah i think one of the things we've got to get over is is, is that the kind of policies that um keir starmer's adopting at the moment would probably make some of the old Social Democratic Party wing of the Labour Party that defected feel a bit queasy. They, they seem to be, the policies we're talking about now, particularly in the economic area, seem to be more moderate and centrist than Shirley Williams, Owen and Rogers were in their heyday. Yeah, I mean, you, we talk when we started about with uh, Harold Wilson ignoring Labour Party policy, actually a government of the character of Harold Wilson these days would be uh, an enormous step forward because they wouldn't have dreamt of uh, uh, having a privatised water industry, you know, but water, it should be absolutely fundamental to life. There's no, there should be no profit involved in the water industry. Uh, and then we see water companies completely failing to meet their obligations, dumping sewage in rivers, and and Labour has retreated from its policy yeah. of renationalising water. Um, and the rail industry is another sort of case in point, at least the current Labour government is, um, or current Labour leadership, sorry, when it's in government is committed to renationalising the rail. But it, it's not too, too much to ask that this profit motive is not in our public services. And, um, I don't think there are many members of the Labour Party who actually can't see that investing in our National Health Service, paying staff, um, ending the private sector's sort of pernicious role of taking uh, money out of the NHS is, is, is bad for everyone. 
Um, yeah, it seems to me that the way we need to rebuild support for the Labour left under a Labour government is to try and build the, the, the broadest possible coalition on those kind of Labour policies that you've just spoken about, which have the overwhelming support amongst still amongst Labour Party members, I would say. And not just members, amongst voters as well. Absolutely, even <laughs> more important. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on international policy, um, Wilson backed America over Vietnam, but he famously refused to commit British troops during Vietnam. Now that that seems that that degree of distance from the from the United States foreign policy would be very welcome if Keir could exercise a bit of that when he's talking about what's happening in Gaza. Yeah, he's entirely on the U.S. coat strings on that, and I think uh, Labour government's policy under Starmer will will essentially back a US foreign policy and that's another issue where we need to to build alliances and it's his um refusal to recognize the genocide that's going on in Gaza to call for a immediate ceasefire is disgusting on humanitarian mm. and moral levels um so i want you know i would always make it about that but it's also electorally very damaging for labor so um you know on every level um Starmer is, is aligned with um the US and the defense industry, I think, as well. And I think you know that the, I I cited Vladimir talking about trying to win over that middle ground with which we agree with on policy but are loyal to the leader. I, I wonder whether there'll be opportunities after the election to begin to explore that much more effectively once once Labour's in government. Yeah, and I remember um, when I was first involved in CLPD, it was just at the time when Labour was going to war in Iraq. And oh, um, Vladimir was absolutely clear that CLPD would take a position against war in Iraq and that, you know, we have taken a very clear position against war in uh, the, the war on Gaza. And you know, it is incumbent on on the left to do that, and we could, and we can build alliances around it. You know, around it, Iraq. Obviously, it went as far as sort of Robin Cook resigning, who'd been no friend to the left. And we have to put the pressure on from amongst the members, amongst the trade unions, but also make make it safe for MPs to yeah. to speak out and to recognise that they will be supported. Um, when they do from the membership and that's why you know one of the chilling things that we've seen under this leadership is the crackdown on free speech you know which is unprecedented really in Labour Party history so again to draw the the differences between the 1970s and now I don't think it would have been there would have been any chance of of telling a 1970s CLP that um <laughs> They couldn't discuss the main issues going on in the world today. Um, yet, with the the rise of Starmer and the, the David Evans and his cronies sort of taking over the bureaucratic leadership of the Labour Party, they can't win the argument. So they stop having the argument, and they won't let yeah. CLPs debate things. But let's just go back to the nineteen sixties. Oh. <laughs> I've just put up a picture on the screen. Um, which I think so in, in CLPD's history is a sort of real iconic picture. And, and, and the placards read, Labour MPs must be chosen by the Labour Party, not the Prime Minister, not Fleet Street, not by themselves. What, what's going on in that picture, Rachel? It seems so, that just sums up what we're about, really, doesn't it? Totally. It's classic CLPD, isn't it? The The picture is part of the campaign to make MPs more accountable. And it, it points out that the Labour candidate for any election, be it parliamentary or um, local, should be selected by the Labour Party, not by the leadership, not by the Prime Minister at the time, not by Fleet Street, um, and or not sort of just self-appointed um, and it couldn't be more relevant <laughs> to the current time could it there is so much central interference into long lists 
and shortlists. Um, and we really have uh, democratic selections by name only. Um, and that's that's what the pitch is about, really. It, it, it is ordinary members campaigning for them to be the ones who have a say, who represents them, who represents their communities. And I think we have to recognise that Labour members are best placed to know who is most likely to win and who is most likely to fight their case in Parliament, but because they will know who is connected, who is based in their communities, the, those who are based in their communities rather than parachuted in from outside will be much more effective at representing them and really bringing the issues of the people into Parliament rather than bringing Parliament into communities. Right. I remember I spoke at Labour Party conference um, the year that we both went up um, two years ago, and I was talking about the rigging of selection meetings. And it was quite interesting because I pointed to the to the hall and said that, that what the debate about is here is whether you, I said, pointing to everybody in the conference hall, are capable of selecting Labour candidates or whether you can't be trusted. And effectively, the Labour leadership was telling everybody in that conference hall they couldn't be trusted with the job of selecting Labour candidates. It had to be done for them and despite them. Yeah, and entirely on a factional basis <laughs> as well. <laughs> it's you know they say it's about quality candidates, but actually it's about people who will toe the party line. And if you if you select people who don't actually have any principles of their own, then they won't stand up for people will they they'll just do what's in their own self-interest and it will end in tears i think as well for well i shouldn't say yeah. i hope it will but i think it the experience of um blair in the 90s um this sort of goes back to your previous podcast with liz davis you know is that members actually get sick of having candidates imposed on them and yeah. in the end people stand against the Labour Party and Labour loses. So it's a, it's it's not going to end well for Labour, I don't think. Yeah, and I think Liz is a very good point because we weren't allowed, Labour members in, in Leeds North East weren't allowed to select her. And we lost someone that ended up becoming a King's Council, giving evidence into the party gate, being involved in the party gate inquiry, um, of, of, and while and questioning Boris Johnson, she's been involved in the Grenfell inquiry. And when you look at the calibre of Labour MPs that emerged in her generation, how on earth could anybody suggest that Liz Davis shouldn't make the cut? It was just, you know, she she would have she would have been a giant amongst many in the parliamentary Labour Party, in my opinion. Yeah, and you see, you mentioned Grenfell, but Emma Dent Code, who was sort of unexpectedly elected in 2017, was an absolutely powerful voice for the community at that time, still fighting for the rights of, of Grenfell, uh, the Grenfell community, and um, was kept off the shortlist, despite being for selection for this time round, um, sadly lost her seat in 2019 because of Labour splits essentially from the right wing showing no loyalty to the Labour Party whatsoever, which we mustn't forget. Um, but then she's, you know, just one of many people who would have been the absolute, you know, best Labour candidate for members to choose from and stopped from stopped from being an MP again. Yeah, I think that the parliamentary Labour Party we need is one that sort of represents many interests, many different wings of the party, and is pluralist of its very nature. We don't want a, a parliamentary Labour Party stuffed full of people that their, their only virtue is their ability to say yes when Keir Starmer requires them to. That, that isn't the kind of talent that you need for good government, I don't think. No, and people who have life experience as well, who've had a, Absolutely. you know, perhaps had a proper job and <laughs> actually talk to ordinary people rather than, you know, what we see is people who go and work for an MP or work for a think tank, then they might be a councillor, but in a sort of quite isolated um, way, and then they get part, they get into Parliament, and they don't have any grounding in their local community or any sort of sense of what it's like to be a a, a working person or to be 
sort of on benefits or to really exist <laughs> in this country at this time. And you you need those voices in Parliament, you, as you say, a, a diversity, a diversity of backgrounds, but people who've got some life experience and who have been selected by members to be the champion for them and not just for them, but for their communities, you know, for voters as well as members. Yeah, I think a, a career that begins in the Labour students' kindergarten at university proceeds to being a policy advisor and running around carrying briefcases for a very important minister and then being catapulted into Parliament isn't necessarily the broadest life experience to govern the country. No, absolutely. Moving on to the unions and campaign for Labour Party democracy, because I think this is really important, because because what I've observed is um, in, in my quite long life is that the Labour left has always been at its most successful when it's working well with the trade unions. Um, when I first came involved and CLPD was in its heyday in the early 1980s, it was the old predecessor of Unison, the National Union of Public Employees, that provided some of the key activists for CLPD in the names of Reg Rafe and Bernard Dix. And they were fresh from the conflict with um, Callaghan's pay restraint. I think because the democracy, dem democratic space in the CLPs at the moment is so closed down, I wonder whether the, the key to unlocking the Labour Party and building the left again is reforging that union support after the general election. What, what do you think of that? I think I wouldn't put a false divide between Labour Party members and trade union members. We are all, or we tend to be both, don't we? So yeah. we have a shared interest. Um, so I think that's important um, to recognise that every Labour Party member should be in a union. Um, I think they're coming for the unions. Um, mm. I think um, under Blair, he set up the um, Phillips Commission, which was to discuss party funding, which was essentially to try and break the link between the Labour Party and the trade unions. I'm absolutely sure that Starmer would like to do the same because when it comes to it, the unions should and will act in the interests of their members. So if a new Labour government um, ends up not raising living standards or investing in public services or um, the New Deal for workers is um, diluted even more, then I'm sure Starmer and those around him would prefer to reduce their influence and therefore I think you know our absolute first priority um, in CLPD will be to recognise that, recognise the Labour Party was founded by the unions and to you know build work with the unions um, to, to keep the link and keep that as a strong and, and democratic link. Um, when I was on the NEC between 2018 and 2020, um, we had extremely good working relationships with the, the left unions. And I think that's still the case between the left on the um, on the NEC. And also when I was, you know, I'm currently on the National Policy Forum and we worked absolutely um, closely with the unions in at the big meeting in Nottingham to you know make sure we were all aligned fighting for the same policies because you know as left organizations in the Labour Party we do we have that shared interest in um, investment in public services in increasing um, wages in line with inflation and beyond redressing the sort of cuts as that we've all faced um, in wages and um, this minimum service level attack um, from the, the current government is um, very disturbing. So, you know, CLPD will be absolutely fighting with the unions to um, reject that. So I'm not I'm not too worried about having a good uh, alliance with the, the trade unions. I think it comes naturally to those of us who actually believe in the Labour Party and believe in what the Labour Party exists for. That really nicely leads us on to the, the economy, Rachel, because I worry that Starmer's committed to, with Rachel Reeves, to a self-imposed fiscal straitjacket. And he's saying he's only going to spend 
and implement Labour's promises as economic growth allows him to do so. So possibly a rhetorical question this, but I'll ask it. Will the magic growth tree deliver? And if it doesn't, what opportunities is that going to give us? I think there is no magic growth tree. <laughs> um, I think economic growth is what could deliver, but sadly, Stalmer and Reeves have not put forward a program mm. for economic growth at all. You know, they've promised to do some very minor fiddles around private schools, um, tax exemptions and um, non-DOM status, which between them will raise not enough to really address, you know, there are crises across childcare, education, higher education, well, sorry, those are things that are very close to, <laughs> to, mm. to, to me, but you know, the health service, local government's been starved of cash. These need addressing, they need a proper plan for investment and growth. And um, everything we hear from Reeves and Starmer is that they're going to stick to Tory spending, which is austerity. You know, they are putting forward a programme of austerity. That's not going to raise living standards. It's not going to address the crisis people face. They're not going to raise benefits where, you know, people on benefits are, you know, really, really struggling. And this pressure will will be felt not just through the Labour Party, but, you know, particularly across the trade unions. Um, it's not good enough to, it won't be good enough just to um, implement the New Deal for workers. I'm not even convinced they <laughs> will stick to that. Um, and we should be repealing all the anti-trade union legislation that's been brought in from Thatcher and, you know, for the last 40, 50 years. So, I think, yeah, we're going to face an interesting time. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it an opportunity, more a sort of obligation or a readiness to put forward an alternative and to fight for, you know, we did, we started with that those cuts on loan parent benefit, didn't we? But you know, that that first fight that we had under the Blair government was to defend loan parents from cuts, and I don't know who the first in line will be. Um, I think that we'll be for those people that are leaving the Labour Party in, in worryingly large numbers at the moment, what, what I'd say is, is that just listen to what you've said and the picture you've painted. And it's that, that we're not going to be able to get the ear of many Labour Party members at the moment because people are just, as you say, putting the shutters down ready for the general election. But a year into a Labour government, if the picture you've just painted is an accurate picture of what a Labour government is going to be like, I think it's at that moment when those middle ground loyalists in the Labour Party will, will give us their ear. I think at that point there is a potential to be um, a change in the balance of forces in the Labour Party if enough of the left have actually stayed to put the arguments when that moment comes. Yeah, I can I can see two scenarios really. I think there's a there's a very large number of um, MPs who tend to go which way the wind blows. Sadly, mm. um, and we need to make sure the wind's blowing in favour of the sort of living standards of the population. There's also um, very important to keep our left MPs in Parliament because to to go back to the Blair times, you know, it was Audrey Wise and Alice Mann who campaign group MPs, you know, MPs from the Socialist Campaign Group who led that campaign. And I think what Starmer and Labour to win represent does not represent the Labour Party. And if we abandon that fight, I know a lot of people leave because they say, I don't want to be aligned with Starmer and what he represents and I always say I don't I don't see myself as aligned <laughs> with Starmer he's not aligned with Labour values you know I am totally aligned with Labour values you know trade union rep working people being represented in Parliament challenging inequalities defending public services that's what the Labour Party should stand for and the front line of the fight for what the Labour Party should stand for is in the Labour Party you're not doing any good outside it. Having said that, I am more than prepared to work with anyone who's 
prepared to defend the NHS against privatisation, who wants to call for immediate ceasefire on Gaza. It doesn't matter where, which party you're in on those key issues. You work together. I couldn't agree with that more. And I think that, yeah, I think I think that's that that is a very accurate way of describing what I think we're about at this point. And I say to people that leave, if you walk out, you know, Keir Starmer said the door's open if we want to leave. If, if the person you identify as your opponent and the person you think is taking the Labour Party in the wrong direction opens the door and invites you to leave through it, what on earth makes you think that that might be the best strategy to stop him doing what he's doing? It's beyond my... Yeah, it's exactly what they want us to do. You know, under Corbyn, a mass of hundreds of thousands of brilliant people came into the Labour Party and even, you know, haven't been in the Labour Party for, for 25 years or whatever. I was like, wow, you've all been out here. This is amazing. Welcome. Let's <laughs> let's do stuff. And to see them all ebbing away again is is quite disappointing. I do. I totally understand it. It's it's not a very pleasant place to be um, at the moment, the Labour Party, because um, they those around Starmer never want to see another Corbyn, do they? Um, because he genuinely challenged the status quo. Um, and although, you know, Jeremy himself is very left wing, actually, the program Absolutely. he put forward was very moderate. And actually, we could all get behind. And that's why I sort of have some hope that there is a alternative future for the Labour Party that isn't the Starmer future. Um, because I think there's a lot of people who saw how popular Jeremy's programme was, our programme as a, a Labour Party. And, you know, not everyone can rewrite history and deny reality, I hope. I think, I think we, we've talked about economic policy and what might happen under a Labour government and how that's going to cause disquiet with the unions. You referred to, under Blair, that they played with the idea of attacking the Labour link between the trade unions and the Labour Party. And I was flicking through the headings that in the Bishopgate archive, the campaign for Labour Party democracy. I didn't go there. I looked at it on the internet. Oh. And there was files called Save the Link, Save the Labour Party, Keep the Party Labour, all campaigns that I'm sure you remember. Do you think we're going to find, if, if the trade unions start rebelling against Starmer because of their, their approach to economic policy, do you think that that kind of scenario might reemerge in under a Starmer government? Yes, yes, I'm absolutely <laughs> sure that's what they'd like to do. I think if you read some of the sort of stuff from I haven't read it for a while, but you know from Mandelson, who's definitely mm. back in the court, and um, some of the other so-called thinkers, um, they see the trade unions as a drag on what they want yeah. to do. Um, and if you're going to be more, ali more like a, the Democrat Party, for example, in the US, where you don't have a serious trade union influence, because trade unions are democratic organisations who are influenced by millions of ordinary people. And the, I see it very much as a sort of the establishment versus the people, which is probably a bit sort of nonsense populist sort of way of thinking about it but it it that is what it is ordinary people do not have a voice in parliament except when the labor party can provide it through a democratic process and that's what the labor party was founded to do and that's what people who would rather align the labor party as um the tory b team you know a safe pair of hands when the tories go through one of their crises um a, a capitalist party essentially who think that all you can do is is manage capitalism um which you can't um so so yeah i think the trade unions could well be a, a drag on or will be wanting to represent their members um to for increased rights at work for increased wages which is not unreasonable and the likes of Reeves do not want to deliver that. But I think that 
another strand of the campaign for Labour Party democracy history has always been the way that we've placed or you've placed the issue of equality at the centre of everything you do. Um, I just want to play you a clip of your good self speaking at the Labour Party conference in 2022, rather creatively trying to um, shoehorn the issue of the Labour rights attack on the equalities agenda into the finance report. The board revealed a culture of racism, sexism and misogyny, as has already been referenced, and um, serious issues have been raised by a disability labour about um, ableism, yet we see our women's committee under-resourced and no sign of the committees and conferences that we agreed this time last year for black and Asian members and disabled members. Um, so how are we using our finances to value our diverse membership? And can you confirm that we do have the finances available to listen to our uh, women, black, Asian and minority ethnic and disabled members and allow them the structures that we've uh, agreed for them? Because we saw from that debate earlier under the women's conference just what value they bring to our conference. Thanks. Well, well done for shoehorning that into the fight. That's debate. Creativity at its best. But I think it raises a serious point. Could you, could you tell us about CLPD's approach to equality and what lied behind your question there, your creative question? Yeah, I mean, I'm always in favour of taking opportunities to have your voice heard, even if it's not the most direct uh, question. Um, and, and it was an important question because actually the, one of the excuses used was for not um, putting conferences on for um, our equality structures was, was finances. And I also knew that the current, the treasurer of the Labour Party at the time, Diana Holland, was a very strong supporter of um, the women's conference and um, made sure it kept happening even when people didn't want it to and would be sympathetic to the question. So, um, and sh she was, but unfortunately she is no longer the treasurer. Um, CLPD has always campaigned for democratic structures, equality structures, and um, in the 80s this was all about sort of women's sections and the black sections because the Labour Party has been a, a place for white men quite a lot um something uh, that trade unions have also been about to a certain extent and uh, CLPD so um, we had a women's group in the 1980s which became the Labour Women's Action Committee which was a leading um exponent of all women shortlists and worked with um across the trade unions and activists to put in place um to win the argument for all women shortlists and a few years ago i'd have said something that we all now agree with but of course the legislation that was brought in did not account for labor having over 50 percent women in parliament and it has meant that the Labour Party has currently ceded to Labour legal advice rather than challenge it and withdrawn from all women shortlists. And of course, that means that after the next election, there will no doubt be less than 50% women. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really proud that CLPD is one of the things that made me get involved in CLPD in the first place was the fact that um, it recognises that women are best placed to make policy on women, that women should be represented at all levels, that um, barriers um, to women's representation have to be overcome um, structurally, not just um, by sort of sheer force of women in, insisting. So, you know, providing childcare, um, having ring fence seats, um, having places where women can organize so for example i mean i first got involved in the labor party through my student labor club women's group i think it's the best way of in encouraging new women to to be involved in the labor party and one of the things i was most proud of being involved with when i was on the nec was creating our new women's structures that meant, you know, voices for women at local level, a standalone women's conference, um, policy making um, with a new women's committee. And it is 
and to then create um, structures for disabled members and Black, Asian, minority ethnic members that would also make sure that uh, disabled members and Black members could organise and have their voices heard and have a structural route into annual conference because that absolutely the most inspiring part of annual conference is the motions that are brought from the women's conference women's conference is just incredible for hearing women's experiences and um bringing those to bear on labor party policy and we should be um doing the same for um for all equality structures actually the, the reason um lgbt labor basically put a block on having similar structures for um lgbt members but i think young members as well this is one of the worst things that this current leadership has done is just basically decide to ignore the rule book and make women's conference a tag on to annual conference and to not even deliver what's in the rule book with regard to black asian minority ethnic members or um disabled members and you can see the impact of that in how I genuinely believe the Labour Party is institutionally racist. I think it's uh, it's absolutely implicit in the Ford report, the way black members are treated. And I think it's got worse. Um, for example, um, you know, in, in Eastern region at the last conference, you could just see that having had the parties, the local Labour parties in Luton and Peterborough suspended, you had a largely white conference and all the black people who were who would have been there were excluded. Um, and that's just one example. It's always the local Labour parties where there's a um, large black or Asian membership who get basically um, carved out. And CLPD has always been a, a champion of local democracy and including members and not enabling um that sort of racist approach for example we you know we campaigned for a long time to um get the parties in birmingham local parties in birmingham reinstated and that's one of the first things i believe that jeremy did when he became yeah. leader was to take action on that and supporting people like raggy basan who you know would take the labor party to actually took the Labour Party to court and, and won because of essentially what's racist treatment. Sorry, that's yeah. rather a longer East, answer East, than you. Yeah, Eastern <laughs> Labour quite Party. quite passionate about that. <laughs> and quite rightly so. And the Eastern Labour Party conference that you spoke about, it's a bit like a, a privatised bus. It's always coming, but it never arrives. It's just astonishing, isn't it, that um, a regional executive committee can get itself elected, be up for re-election and decide itself that oh, actually it can't be bothered to be re-elected. It would be better if we carried on. Can you imagine Parliament doing that every every year? I, I think they must have read Animal Farm. Yeah. <laughs> um, moving to the, today, we've got the, the the big reason for doing this look at CLPD's history and where we're at is because we've got the CLPD AGM coming up on the 11th of February. So, Rachel, tell us what's going to be happening at that. And if... If CLPD members are um, listening, how they attend, or if you're not members, how you can join so you can attend. What can they expect on the 11th of February at the CLPD AGM? Well, the AGM, we try and make a good balance of hearing from speakers and allowing members to speak for themselves. So um, I don't think our speakers are tied down quite yet, but we will have um, some left MPs, some left trade unionists, um, and you know we need to bring the alliances together that we want to work with in the coming year. So that's what we'll be doing. Um, we've got motions submitted, so we prioritise motions on areas of party democracy, as you would expect. Um, so um, we've got motions on the selection of candidates, which we've covered a lot already, which is still absolutely fundamental to CLPD's campaigning priorities on the equality structures, again, which um, we've covered on freedom of speech. So enabling CLPs to actually discuss and make policy and on their disciplinary processes, which we haven't covered yet today, but you know, is a, the way that there is factional abuse of the disciplinary processes, I think is another, and the prescription of organisations and then the expulsion of really good comrades just because they liked one 
tweet, you know, in uh, many years ago, or they, you know, the, the way those processes have been abused, I think it remains central to CLPD's priority. And then um, there'll be some policy um, areas. Um, so um, we've talked about Gaza, but also where CLPD was really proud to be part of the, the left block on the last demonstration. Um, and privatization, workers' rights, there's so many areas where we, we want a different policy. And then finally, um, we will have hopefully some of our NEC candidates. So one of our big priorities for this year will to be get will be to get left voices back on the NEC because although the left is nowhere near a majority, it is very important to hold the leadership to account as far as possible and to find out what on earth is going on. Um, and I know uh, the current left reps are restanding and I hope that everyone will get themselves organised to um, make sure we get nominations in for, for Jess Barnard, Mishram and Gemma Bolton and Yasmin Dar. And we always look forward to hearing them in CLPD and they do a great job in holding Starmer to account in very, very difficult circumstances. They so certainly they... take one for the team, don't they? On that <laughs> job, And you know better than most. The NEC is not a fun place to be <laughs> at all. Even in the good times, it's uh, <laughs> it wasn't that good, I can assure you. <laughs> the, the other event we've got in the pipeline is on the 17th of February, we've got the Arise Conference, which um, CLPD is supporting as well. Tell us about that and what people can expect. And that, that's an in-person event, isn't it? Which is rather nice in these days of, these days of Zoom very very niche um yeah um it's a day school organized by arise the festival and we in clpd we really do support the events they put on and they support us in promoting our agenda because we're you know we're all on the same side really um and so i think arise plays a really crucial role in political education um for members and um Putting a, uh, giving a platform to a really wide range of activists and trade unionists and some of their more educational events um, are really worth a listen as well. Like I chaired um, something about Sylvia Pankhurst. I know they've done something recently on Rosa Luxemburg. So um, they do very current um, issues of, you know, supporting strikes or um, NHS privatisation, you know, they'll keep those issues to the fore, but they'll also add sort of value on, you know, what's going on in Latin America or um, very close links to Labour in Palestine as well. We recently recently did an event with Mustafa Barghouti where he was sharing the situation in, in Palestine, which was absolutely a um, very powerful event. So I do recommend that people uh, sign up to the Arise mailing list, come along. It's really nice to see people face to face occasionally, isn't it? <laughs> Even it though... is. So that's um, Saturday the 17th of February. It starts at 11 a.m. and it's going to be at a central London venue to be announced, a world to win socialist solutions for the crisis. So finally, Rachel, our regular and positive feature because in these, um, in the current conjuncture, as they say, things aren't always that good. But we like to have a class hero um, for each of our Labour Left podcast episodes. So far, we've had Ken Loach um, and Attila the Stockbroker. Who are you going to add to the class hero Hall of Fame? Oh, this is a really difficult one um, because I have lots of class heroes. Um, I would ideally go for the whole sort of population of Palestine for what they're going through at the moment and their capacity to resist. Um, but um, if I have to plump for an individual, I will plump for Diane Abbott because she is truly my political hero. I was um, I was a youth officer many years ago um, back in Hackney North and women's officer there. And she has been an absolute champion of women's rights. Um, anti-racism and it was very privileged to be on the NEC with her for a, a, a while and she was you know the most reliable supporter of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership 
very good friend of CLPD. She will always come and speak at our women's events in particular because she she likes to tell the story and we like to hear the story of how she you know stormed the stage in her dungarees campaigning for all women shortlists which is an absolute inspiration um, and she remains an inspiration and the way she has been treated by Starmer is absolutely unforgivable in my book um, yeah she's my hero I can't think of a, a better person I I used to be in her constituency for a short period and uh it was one of those rare, rare moments in my life where I've actually managed to vote for a Labour candidate with real enthusiasm. It doesn't happen very often, but um, when I voted for Diane, that was um, one of my finest voting moments I really enjoyed. And I think that when you look back to what she was instrumental in delivering in black sections, which broke the barrier and allowed those black MPs to get into Parliament, it's not just what she's achieved herself, it's what she enabled um, others to achieve that came after her as well. I think the younger generation would do well to read her autobiography. She's got a fantastic story to tell and, um, yeah, huge respect for Diane. And the way, I could echo what you said, the way she has been treated is absolutely appalling. But um, we stand with her, don't we? Absolutely. Always. <laughs> <laughs> so on that fantastic note, celebrating one of the best Labour left comrades of, of the last 20 years or more. Um, thank you very much, Rachel. And um, thanks for appearing on the Labour left podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for watching the Labour left podcast. The podcast was brought to you in association with Labour Hub, the excellent left news site, which gives you the very best news from the class struggle front line. You can find us on the web at labourhub.org.uk. That's labourhub.org.uk. Um, I do urge you to have a look. It's a great website, great source of labour movement news. I'm Bryn Griffiths, the show presenter, and our editor is Luke Robinson. Before we finish, I would like to thank you all for your feedback in response to our second podcast with Momentum co-chair Hilary Shan. Pete Fernan thought the last podcast was a bit soft on Hilary Momentum, but Pete... With the Labour left hemorrhaging support due to demoralisation, my motivation was to point to the positive things we're still doing in the Labour Party. I'm not merely an interested commentator. I'm a, I'm a momentum activist. I wanted to help Hillary showcase the campaigning role of a council Labour group when it has an active left presence. As Gillian Guest said about the podcast, the more chances Hillary is given to speak, the better it is for the many and not the few. Finally, if you're enjoying the podcast, give the podcast a like and a follow. Please, please, please share it with your friends. Each time you do something to promote our podcast and the other great podcasts on the Labour Left, you're helping create our own alternative media. Let us all work together to voice alternative opinions from the front line and escape the grip of Britain's legacy media. Next time, on the 6th of March, to mark the 40th anniversary of the Great Miners' Strike, we have got a real treat in store for you. I will be joined by the legendary Mike Jackson, the founder and secretary of Lesbians and Gays Support the Miners. Subscribe now to make sure you don't miss it. So go to your podcast site, go to YouTube, click subscribe, and make sure you don't miss the next episode of the Labour Left podcast. See you next time.